Thank you, and you may be seated. I want to welcome all of you again to Calvary Community Church, and also welcome those of you that are watching by way of the uh, internet. Uh, we understand from our web server that people from California to New York and everything in between uh, were watching the uh, internet uh, broadcast of this service uh, last week. And uh, we're excited about that option. I thought most of them would be local, that our church people would stay home and not come to church, but uh, that didn't happen. So we're excited about all of those that are uh, around the country watching tuning into our website, and for the, the others of you that are here, we're so glad that you're here. I want to share this little story. Uh, the man says, I needed a few days off, but I knew the boss would not allow me to take a leave. I thought that maybe if I acted crazy, that uh, he would tell me uh, to take a few days off. So I hung upside down on the ceiling and made funny noises. And uh, my co-worker, who's blonde, asked me what I was doing. I told her that I was pretending to be a light bulb so that the boss would think I was crazy and give me a few days off. Well, a few minutes later, the boss came into the office and said, what are you doing? So I told him that I was a light bulb. And he said, you're clearly stressed out. Why don't you go home and recuperate for a few days. So I jumped down and walked out of the office. My coworker, the blonde, followed me, and the boss asked her and said, where do you think you're going? As she continues to walk on out of the office, she said, I'm going home too. I can't work in the dark. <laughs> Let's open our Bibles. We're going to go to the book of Matthew, and uh, we are going to be in chapter 13 of the book of Matthew. You probably got that hint when you heard Chris Sands read these scriptures for you. And we talked last week about parables. Parables were written to not reveal truth, but to conceal truth. That surprises most people. Most people think the opposite. If you were to ask the average person, why did Christ speak in parables, they probably would say he was telling a simple story to be able to get a point across so that it could be clearly understood. But that is not the case. If you'll drop down in this chapter 13 of Matthew, you'll notice in verse 13, Jesus says, Therefore speak I to them in parables, because they seeing see not, and hearing they hear not, neither do they understand. And in them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah, which saith, By hearing ye shall hear, and shall not understand, and seeing ye shall see, and not perceive. For this people's heart is waxed gross, or grown gross, and their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes, notice it says, they have closed, lest at any time they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and should understand with their heart and should be converted and I should heal them. And this is the principle we spoke about last week where God has written the Bible in such a way to conceal truth from those that consider themselves to be wise and prudent and yet he reveals his truths to those that are seeking even a child can understand the gospel message. Notice, then Jesus speaks to his disciples and says, But blessed are your eyes, for they see, and your ears, for they hear. So there is like a filtering effect when you read the Bible. For those that want to know the truth, the truth comes through. For those that don't want to know the truth, it seems like the truth is blocked out. And we know for sure that people that are not saved uh, are not really going to grasp much at all from God's Word. Hold your place here and turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and look at this verse. And if you haven't marked it yet, please mark it today. And this one is a, a good one to keep in your uh, listing of verses that you would want to use uh, 
you'll find that people that don't know the Lord will oftentimes say things like, the Bible doesn't make any sense to me. Or the Bible seems to be just a lot of foolishness. Well, guess what? Look at verse 14. 1 Corinthians 2, page 12, 13. It says, but the natural man, that refers to the person who is not yet born again. The person who is simply born into this world and has the sin nature of Adam, the natural man, the unsaved man, the man who has not been born again, it says, receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are what? Foolishness. Those are the very phrases you'll hear out of people. And it goes on to say here, neither can he know them. They'll say it doesn't make any sense. I can't understand the Bible. And it goes on to say, because they are spiritually discerned. So when somebody tells me, I don't make heads or tails out of the Bible. It doesn't make any sense to me. I just don't get much out of it. I, In my mind, I don't tell them, but I say they're probably not saved. Uh, it seems that when you get saved, all of a sudden the light turns on and uh, you begin to understand. Now, you may not understand all the Bible, but at least all of a sudden now the Bible becomes uh, sensible. And uh, I know that as you study, all of a sudden then God illuminates your understanding. And uh, the Bible talks about illumination, where God illuminates our understanding as we read uh, the Scriptures. And this is, a, 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 I think, a wonderful passage to be familiar with when you're talking to people that you would not be discouraged and say, well, uh, or encourage their, their not understanding the Bible, but maybe tell them, well, you need to know the Gospel first. And once you trust Christ, then it's like the light turns on. And uh, this is a great verse to use. Now let's go back to Matthew. We find here that the disciples were the ones that inquired of this parable. And Christ explains it to the disciples, but the multitude really didn't get to understand what this parable was all about. And oftentimes, because parables can be interpreted almost any way you want, a lot of people go astray on the parables. In fact, you could probably, if you have six commentaries, get maybe six different ideas about what a parable is all about. And I know as a young believer that was confusing to me. And I wondered, how can that happen? But obviously I learned later. And you've got to be careful that you interpret them in the light of other Scripture because that is the best commentary you can get on the Bible is the Bible itself. And we have a real treat here with this parable of the wheat and the tares because Jesus himself interprets it for us. And so Jesus being God, he is the author of Scripture and he certainly knows the meaning and he is the one that will explain this one for us. And that's the beginning of understanding the other parables because when we lock in understanding what Christ says here about this parable, we learn how to unlock the truths of the other parables. I've also observed something as well, where churches don't have sound doctrine. They usually focus a lot on teaching the parables. And what does that tell you? Uh, they go all over the place with them, and they can pretty much uh, support whatever they want to support in the way of their teachings with the parables, and that's why you need to be cautious when you approach the parables, because again, why? They weren't written to reveal truth, but they were written to conceal truth, and Christ spoke in parables that seeing they would see but not see, and hearing they would hear but not hear, and they would not understand, and uh, they would not trust the Lord and not be saved. And God conceals the truth from those who don't really want to know the truth. Let's go now over to verse 36, and this is Matthew chapter 13, verse 36. Then Jesus sent the multitude away. And the multitudes heard the parable, but they, I'm sure, didn't really grasp what it was all about. But notice then, he went into the house, and his disciples came unto him, and they said, Lord, declare unto us the parable of the tares of the field. And he answered and said unto them, and now Jesus here explains this parable. But notice, the multitudes... And the majority of those who might read the Bible are probably not going to 
get much out of the Bible and are not going to get much out of the parables until they come to know Christ. And then, obviously, as Christ explained the parable to His disciples, so when you and I study the Bible and we ask the Lord for help in understanding the Bible, He can illuminate our understanding so that we can learn and figure out what's going on in this book. So this is not an ordinary book. There's no doubt about it. It is a book that uh, has like a filter that filters out those who aren't seeking and don't want to know truth from those that are seeking and want to know truth. And so even a child can understand it. Let's go over to Matthew just a few pages before. I believe I covered this last week, but I want to read it one more time because here Jesus again is saying a prayer here. Now, Christ began to upbraid, verse 20 of Matthew 11, the cities wherein most of his mighty works were done because they repented not. Now, again, you must recognize that the word repent from the Greek means to change your mind. It does not mean sorrow for sin. It does not mean to turn from sin. And this is because of a translation problem. Back in 1611, the English word repent did not mean the same thing as the Greek word metanoia. And so it's just a bad translation. And it should never have happened. The Greek word metanoia means change your mind. The word meta means change. Noia means mind. The two together mean a change of mind. And that's really all it means in the New Testament. And here... They should have changed their mind and recognized who Christ was because of the miracles that he did, which had been prophesied of in the Old Testament, which were a visible sign that this was indeed the Messiah that would come. Because Isaiah had said that the Messiah, when he comes, will cause the lame to walk, the blind to see, the deaf to hear, the dumb to speak, and so on. And Christ did all of those things. And so he raised the dead. And these were all signs of what the Messiah would be able to do when he came. And Christ did all those things. And so it says here, he began to upbraid the cities wherein most of his mighty works were done because they did not repent. They did not change their mind. There are three cities here that are mentioned. Chorazin, Bethsaida, and the last one is Capernaum. These are all cities located around the perimeter of the Sea of Galilee. Now, what is interesting is that these three cities, because of their unbelief, God, in a sense, put a curse upon them. I'll never forget, on my first trip to Israel, this is one of those visual lessons that happen when you travel there, is that we took a boat ride from Tiberias, a city that is still around to this very day, and that's really the biggest city on the uh, Sea of Galilee. And there are beautiful buildings there and, and lots of uh, uh, shops and waterfront properties and so on. And it uh, is a, a fairly significant city uh, in Israel today. Well, we took a, a boat ride uh, across the Sea of Galilee, and we were headed for Capernaum, which is on the northern edge of the Sea of Galilee. And as we got closer and closer, I kept looking for a city like we had left. I looked for buildings and I looked for evidences of a city and saw nothing. And I thought to myself, what is going on here? And of course, I asked our guide, where is Capernaum? And he said, that dock. <laughs> and uh, we stepped off and we walked through the ruins of ancient Capernaum which is probably the city where Peter was raised. In fact, uh, they claim they have discovered Peter's house there. Now, I really think sometimes uh, they go a little bit too far, but uh, they were just little small little uh, excavations of where people lived. These fishermen lived a very simple life. and uh, But the Roman Catholic Church, which likes to mark every spot, has uh, determined that this was Peter's house. Now, I don't know if they found a mailbox and it said, Simon Peter, deliver all my mail here, or whether they found something else. I don't think they found any of those things. But in any case, we find that 
uh, they have now built a church in the shape of a boat over that little excavation uh, to mark the spot. And, and to me, it just destroys the, the beauty of the ancient ruins because all you see now is this like an ark uh, on stilts above the excavations supposedly of Peter lived. My guide said, in fact, if the Roman Catholic Church could have discovered the exact spot where Jesus walked on the water, they would probably have tried to build a church on top of that spot. But in one way, uh, some of these things are good because these different spots that have become special and churches have been built sometimes preserve the site so that nothing else happens there. So there's pluses and minuses. But in any case, this was Peter's city. And all three of these cities today, no one lives in any of them. They're just ruins of the ancient cities that were there. Look at what it says in verse uh, 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 23 here. And thou, Capernaum, which art exalted unto heaven, shall be brought down to hell. For if the mighty works which had been done in thee had been done in Sodom, it would have remained until this day. And so Christ really pronounces a curse upon these three cities. And you know, other cities that are around the Sea of Galilee that were lived in at the time of Christ are still lived in. But the three that he mentions, nobody lives in them. They're just the ruins of the ancient cities. Wow. Is that a coincidence? I don't think so. I believe that when Christ speaks, he's God, and certainly things happen exactly the way that he says that they would. And to me, that was a very real evidence to me of the accuracy of the Bible and why we can trust this book because there are things that you and I can see today that God said thousands of years ago that are absolutely evidences of the fact that this has to be the Word of God. And God here cursed those three cities because of their unbelief. And we find that all three cities are just ruins today. And and uh, I have visited all of these cities and and I'm sure that if we go this coming March, which we plan to do, we'll be able to visit Capernaum again. There was the remains there of a synagogue there. And obviously we know Christ had to have visited that synagogue. And so as you walk around uh, the remains of that synagogue, you could know that you were walking where Jesus walked. And of course, he walked throughout the city streets, but you could be pretty sure that Christ actually... uh, made his way around in that synagogue as the Bible talks about him speaking in that synagogue. And so you can actually say in many places, this is where Jesus walked. This is where he taught. And here he curses these three cities because they rejected truth. And then last week we read just the prayer, but then Jesus stands up and prays and says, at that time, Jesus answered and said, I thank thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because thou hast hid these things from the wise and prudent, the people in these cities thought they knew it all and were proud in their wisdom. And notice God closed their eyes. They were not able to see the truth, even though Jesus walked through their streets. And notice it says here, you've hidden these things from the wise and prudent and hast revealed them unto babies. A child can understand the scriptures if that child is seeking. But a person who is got a high IQ, is pretty bright, can miss the truth because God hides it from those who really aren't seeking and don't want to know truth. But God will reveal the truth to those that are seeking. You might ask yourself, do you have a seeking heart? Do you really want to know what God has to say? Because that is the key to understanding the scriptures. You have to say, I want to know. Turn, if you will, back to Proverbs. I'm coming back to Matthew, so don't lose your place. But turn, if you will, to the book of Proverbs. And we have here uh, some very interesting verses that give us this uh, wonderful insight into how to understand your Bible. You might be saying, I don't understand much about the Bible. Well, maybe here is some good advice from God in His Word about understanding the Bible. It says in Proverbs chapter 2, page 673, My son, 
It says here in chapter 2, verse 1, and notice the conditional word, if thou wilt receive my words and hide my commandments with thee, so that thou incline thine ear unto wisdom and apply thine heart to understand. Yea, if thou criest after knowledge and liftest up thy voice for understanding, if Thou seekest her as silver and searchest for her as for hid treasures. Verse 5, notice the word then. Then shalt thou understand. So guess what? The prerequisite for really understanding the Bible, for having the Bible make sense, is to be wanting to receive what God has to say. When you come to church, do you come to learn do you come with a thirsting to find out what God has to say? Or do you just say, I'm putting in my time and I'm going to clock in and clock out and go do the rest of my whatever I want to do today? Well, obviously, the Bible here talks about a desire to receive, verse 1, my words, and hide His commandments with you, that you embrace them and, and you and you kind of... Uh, take them and tuck them in your mind where you can uh, savor them and enjoy them. Verse 2, so that you incline your ear unto wisdom. What does that phrase mean, incline your ear? You know, if somebody's whispering sometimes, if somebody wants to eavesdrop, what do they do? <laughs> they incline their ear. They get a better angle so that their ear will pick up as much of the conversation as they possibly can. And you've maybe done that. I'm sure you have. And so the Bible is saying here, when God is speaking or when you're approaching the Bible, you need to be kind of like this, listening real carefully, attuning yourself to hear what God is saying. Sometimes when you incline your ear, you seem to screen out other noises and distractions and you really pay close attention that conversation you want to overhear. Well, that's the way believers ought to approach the Bible if they want to understand the Scriptures. And then notice in verse 2 the word, apply thine heart to understand. Apply your heart to understand. The heart means your mind, the center of your thought processes. Turn your brain on. When you come to church, is your brain turned on? Or are you still in the pause mode when you come in. Oh, it's over? They're done? <laughs> We're leaving? Have you been thinking? Is your mind turned on? Are you applying your God-given computer, your brain, as you listen? Are you taking in what is being said and processing what is being said? Is it making sense as you begin to turn the wheels up in your head and uh, apply your mind to understand verse 3 very interesting here it says yea and there's that conditional word if again if you cry after knowledge uh, you know when you want something badly sometimes you holler out and I hey <laughs> stop uh, and and you're asking and you're crying out for knowledge and you lift up your voice you might even you know cry out so that others will overhear your cry. And it's saying here in verse uh, 4, if you seek God's Word and seek the wisdom He has within it as silver and searcheth for her as for hid treasures. You know, if somebody told you that some back in time, somebody buried a chest of money in your backyard and you bought the house with no knowledge of this, would you go out and start digging around in your backyard trying to find it? Otherwise, you wouldn't bother to pick up a shovel and mess around with the dirt in your yard and get dirty in the process. But if you knew on pretty good sources that somebody who lived in that house before didn't trust the banks and they buried their, their treasure in a, in a box... In the, underneath that backyard, I think you'd be out there digging, wouldn't you? The Bible is saying, would you go to that same effort to find out what God has to say? Would you 
soil your hands a little bit and maybe work up a little perspiration and, and work at it a little bit hard to understand what God has to say. Unfortunately, a lot of Christians don't do that, and that's why they never make any progress in understanding the Bible. It takes some work on your part, and you have to seek it like you would be seeking hid treasure or seeking after silver or for gold. And verse 5 is that key word that I have got a big circle around it. It says, then. Then. Then what? Shalt thou understand. You want to know more about the Bible? This is the key. You have to want to know. You have to have that hunger, that desire. You have to seek. And if you seek, you'll find. If you are proud and you think that you know everything and you're wise and prudent, God says, I'm going to hide the truth from those folks. And Jesus even prayed and said, I thank thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that thou hast hid these things from the wise and prudent, but you've revealed them unto babies. So where are you? Where do you stand? Are you wanting to know? Do you care? Is it important to you? Or do you come on Sunday morning just to fill up a space and say, I went to church again? And a lot of people, I think, perhaps do. But I think that we need to come with a hunger, come with a desire, and take advantage of opportunities where we can learn more about what God's Word has to say. Because the Lord wants to give us this wisdom. And for somebody who's seeking, uh, they will find it. Let's go back to Matthew chapter 11 for just one more moment. And I want you to note here that there are degrees of punishment in hell. We find in each of these uh, curses that God puts or Christ puts upon these three cities, He says here, for example, verse 22, I say unto you, and he's talking about the first two cities, Chorazin and Bethsaida. I say unto you, verse 22. And notice when Christ speaks, he speaks directly as God. He doesn't quote somebody else, but Jesus said, I say unto you. It shall be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon at the day of judgment. Now that day of judgment, you might want to make a note, is the great white throne judgment that will occur at the end of the millennial kingdom when all the unsaved dead are brought up out of Hades and will be judged for degree of punishment in hell. And notice what he's saying here. There were two cities that God destroyed in the Old Testament, Tyre and Sidon, which have been recently in the news in the recent skirmish between uh, Lebanon and Israel and the uh, forces there. They fired rockets on these ancient biblical cities. And it says here, it's going to be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon at the day of judgment than for you. Wow. In other words, the people in these cities that rejected greater light because Jesus himself, God in flesh, walked through their streets, were going to be held more accountable and we're going to receive a greater degree of judgment and punishment in hell than the cities of Tyre and Sidon that God destroyed because they didn't have as much light that they rejected. Can you imagine the accountability of being able to have been living in a city where Jesus passed through and to reject him will be required of you one day. It says in verse 24, after Christ pronounces his judgment upon Capernaum, but I say unto you that it shall be more tolerable for the land of Sodom at the day of judgment than for thee. Isn't that a surprising one? Sodom, a very wicked city that we know that God rained fire and brimstone down upon and destroyed it. God says they're going to be better off before they're cast into hell than you will be because you have rejected greater light. This was the city of Peter and John. Uh, this was the city of the where a great deal of light was shed and where Christ himself came and did many of his wonderful works. And we find here that uh, Christ says it's going to be more tolerable, the day of judgment being the great white throne judgment, for the land of Sodom, when they're given a degree of punishment in hell, 
the people of Sodom aren't going to be punished as badly as the people of Capernaum that rejected truth. Isn't that an amazing thing? You hardly hear anybody ever preach about degrees of punishment in hell. But the Bible certainly teaches it, and this is just one place where it talks about some are going to be held more accountable than others because of light that they have rejected or deeds that they've committed, and they will suffer a greater de degree of punishment in hell. So we find here that God wants to reveal truth, but he reveals it to those that seek. Let's go now over to verse 26 where Christ concludes his prayer. Even so, Father, for so it seemed good in thy sight. Verse 27, all things are delivered unto me of my Father. And no man knoweth the Son but the Father. Neither knoweth any man the Father save the Son, and he to whomsoever the Son will reveal him. Now the answer, of course, to that is that he does reveal himself to those that are seeking. But he doesn't reveal himself to those that are not. I'm often asked about people in other lands and people that maybe haven't necessarily heard the gospel, but I don't think you have to go to other lands to find that true. You can come right here to America and go to the far outreaches of Port, Saint, of Port Tampa or uh, Lutz or Land O'Lakes or maybe Sefner. Is that, is that where you live? Uh, Chris Evans tell me they still deliver the milk by wagon out there in Sefner. I think that's not true, but that's what he told me. But wherever you might be, if you are seeking, you're going to find. If a person hasn't heard the gospel, and I don't care where they live on the planet, God will see that the message of the gospel gets to them if they are seeking. But if a person is not seeking, God is not necessarily required to give them the gospel message. And that is the amazing, wonderful truth of this book. And if you, as a believer, are willing to share the gospel, God is going to have you crossing paths with people who are seeking, and God will give you the blessing of being the one to transmit the message to that seeking person through you. And I hear people share stories with me all week long of how they were so excited that this person that they talked to uh, was receptive to the track they gave them or the conversation that they had opened up and, and how the person uh, was grateful to have received the knowledge of how to be saved. And I believe if you are going to keep your mouth zipped, then you'll never experience that. But if you are going to be willing to witness, God will have you cross paths with people who are seeking, and you're going to have the thrill of sensing God is using me to bring the message to people that are seeking and he connects people up. And you see that throughout the Bible. And it really will add a, a dimension to your Christian life that you will never have believed possible before. And some of you that are shy, uh, there are different ways you can do this. You know, a lot of people I have heard about in this church are witnessing all over the planet to people on the internet. They go on and they get into different chat rooms and bring up the gospel and witness and have led people to Christ in other countries. I haven't done that. But uh, I'm hearing about people who regularly go on and they've got answers already set to go and they cut and paste and <laughs> fire answers right back at these people when they bring up a pr question or objection. And so they go <laughs> and this fire away uh, truth to people over the internet. If you're still behind the times and don't have a computer, letters work. You know, you can write a letter to somebody. We had a family in our church at one time that just decided they would do as a project, open the white pages, and they would call 10 numbers a day and just say, if you got a couple of minutes, I want to share something with you. And a lot of people hung up, but they would get a couple that would listen. And they were able to lead people to Christ over the phone they can't hurt you through the phone, I don't think. Um, they, can, they can 
bark at you, but they can't really hurt you. You're pretty much at a safe distance. So for those that are a little bit shy, you know, be creative. There are ways to share the gospel. And I would hear stories from them all the time. I called up and this person didn't know what they were saying yes to, but they listened and, and you know, they wound up trusting Christ as Savior. And I think that God can perhaps give you a creative idea. Holidays are coming up. Are you going to have relatives over for Thanksgiving or maybe Christmas? Are they all saved? Is there an opportunity for you sometime during that meal time or getting together time that you could share the gospel with those lost relatives? Are you planning ahead and saying, wow, you know, we could invite so-and-so over for Thanksgiving, maybe a neighbor, not even a relative. Have them share Thanksgiving at your home and you could maybe share the gospel when they come over to your house. Have you planned ahead? Have you thought of a way to bring the gospel to somebody else? Have you thought about inviting somebody to church? That's a clever idea. Wow. <laughs> Invite somebody to church? Why? They might hear the plan of salvation here at Calvary Community if they come here. Have you thought about that? And all different kinds of little ideas where you could plug in and really get excited about how you could be... I'll tell you what. When you invite a guest and you know they're lost and you're praying for their salvation, it just makes everything different about the whole service. Usually some of those who invited somebody will catch me in the hall and they say, you better be good today. <laughs> I've been working all year on getting this family to come to church and don't fail me. Don't mess up today, buddy. They almost threatened me. <laughs> it's amazing. Boy, I never knew that it was that, that side of that particular person. Usually mild-mannered and soft-spoken, and, and all of a sudden they're almost threatening because when they brought a lost person with them and they want them to get saved, they, they want them to get saved, and they don't want me to mess up. Well, think about it. You know, it really will be transforming for you because you can just come every week, and that's great. But if you thought about inviting somebody, and you have somebody that's met you here at the door, or you've uh, picked them up and driven them over here in your car, uh, the whole service is, is seen through different eyes when you're trying to see it through the eyes of your guest that you're hoping will listen and, and come to know Christ as Savior. It really will change your life. And everybody here, I'm sure, could think of somebody you could invite out, especially over the holidays, to invite them out to our Thanksgiving dinner or Christmas dinner or the uh, children's program that's going to be put on and different things that we have going on. These are opportunities. To invite somebody to watch on the Internet uh, our television programs or, or radio. or You know we're going to make sure that the gospel is presented. And then try to get some feedback and see what happened. And twice this week somebody has told me how they gave them the CD, How Permanent Is Your Salvation? One person told me they had almost written off this person. They gave them the CD and thought, well, that's the end of that, and I'll never see him again, perhaps, and they certainly won't listen to it. Well, this week that person came back and said, I understand how to be saved now. And they got saved through listening to that CD, How Permanent Is Your Salvation? That's been used to win so many people to Christ. And get them to play it put it in their CD player or give it to them to listen to. What an effective tool we have with so many things that we have out here today and with the tracks that we have back in the rack. Try some of those. Take them with you and give them out to somebody. Well, uh, we've really made our way through that parable, didn't we? Uh, <laughs> we'll have to approach that parable and as let Christ explain it to us uh, next week. But let's go over to John 3, and with this we'll close today because the clock says we don't have any more time. And uh, I want to make sure you take a look at this verse, maybe with fresh eyes. I find that when you look at a verse, you can see it with fresh eyes sometimes. And what I mean by that, the verse may be familiar, but all of a sudden you see it in a new light. John 3.16, I could quote as a child, but when I got saved, then whoosh, this verse came alive to me. 
And I realized he was talking about me. But think about this. John 3.16, page 11.17, these are the words of Jesus Himself. And I think that changes a lot for us. Because uh, if you have a red-letter edition of the Bible, these will be in red. It's Christ who said this. Jesus tells us. He says, For God so loved the world. And then in the next phrase, that He gave His only begotten Son. He's talking about Himself. Isn't that amazing? I get chill bumps when I think about that. Here is Christ talking about God's purpose for Him to come into this world. That because God loved the world so greatly and so deeply that He says, He gave me. He gave me His only begotten Son. Have you seen John 3.16 through those eyes? The eyes of Christ. As Christ is here talking about the eternal purpose of God the Father in providing redemption for the human race and that He's telling about what His Father chose to do. That my Father was willing to sacrifice His only Son so that you could be saved and that everybody in the human race could go to heaven. That whosoever that would believe or trust in Christ, that person would not perish, but that person would have everlasting life. I find that the Bible never is dull because you can look at a verse and see it through new lenses almost every time you look at it. And perhaps that's a new look at John 3.16 that Jesus is speaking. He's talking about the love of His Father for you and for me and everybody on the planet. And Jesus is saying, He loved you so much, He was willing to sacrifice me and let me die and be buried and rise again from the dead so that whosoever that would believe or trust in Christ would not perish, but they would have everlasting life. Wow. How do we fit into that? Do we care about people at all? God the Father loved the world enough to give His Son. How much do we care about the lost? Are we willing to tell them, to invite them, to share the message? Are we willing to risk a little bit in the sense that, yes, yeah, somebody might not like it, somebody might be offended, somebody might turn their head away from you? Are you willing to risk that? Because God cared and you wanted to share the fact that He cared to them and you know He cared for you because you've received Him as your Savior and as a result you're going to heaven. Think about it. Let's bow in prayer and we're going to quit with heads bowed with eyes closed. My friend, where would you go if you were to die? If you came today, maybe you're a guest of someone and you didn't know how to go to heaven. Chances are you didn't understand the plan of salvation if you didn't know when you came here. Because the believer can know and can be assured of going to heaven from the moment they believe. Right now, you could receive this free gift of eternal life. You could receive the forgiveness of your sin. How? You could whisper a prayer between you and the living God right now. If you don't know what to say, you could say something like, God, I admit that I'm a sinner. I've done things wrong. That's just being honest because we've all sinned and have come short of the glory of God. But God, right here and now, what I heard made a lot of sense to me. And I trust Jesus Christ right now as my Savior. I believe He died on the cross of Calvary and shed His blood to pay for my sins. I believe Jesus was then buried and then that He rose again from the dead, that He's alive forevermore. And I trust Jesus Christ right now as my Savior. I trust Him to, to forgive my sin and give me the gift of eternal life. I trust Him to be my only hope of reaching heaven. The moment you do that, God up in heaven knows and He saves you. Would you do it right now? If you're looking for a feeling, 
You may be disappointed we're never promised a feeling, although you might have a feeling of relief or, or joy in discovering this wonderful message. But we're not promised a feeling. We have God's Word on it. God is not going to lie. He's not going to trick you. If God said it and you believe it, my friend, that settles it. Trust Him right now. Lord, I am a sinner, but I trust Jesus right now as my Savior. I trust Him as the one who died and shed His blood so that I might be forgiven. I trust Him as my only hope of reaching heaven. If you did that here this morning, God up in heaven knows He saves all those that trust Christ. And if you did that here this morning, I'd like to include you in my closing prayer. We're not going to have anybody forward. We're not going to have anybody running up and grab you by the shoulder. In fact, we're doing it this way on purpose so that you'll not be put on the spot or embarrassed in any way. I'm going to be the only one looking. And I'm going to close in prayer in just a moment. We'll be dismissed. But while no one is looking but me, I'd love to be able to include you in my closing prayer without identifying you or pointing you out. But if you prayed this prayer this morning to trust Christ, would you lift your hand and let me see? God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. All right, God bless you. That's four, I believe. All right, put your hand down. God bless you, son. Yes. Anybody else? I trusted Jesus Christ as my Savior right here this morning. Slip up your hand where I could see it. I see another child raising uh, his hand. All right. Anyone else? Four adults and two children. Anybody else? I trusted Christ just now. I'd like you to know. I'd like you to pray for me. Slip up your hand and put it back down. Heavenly Father, we thank you. We rejoice for these four adults and two children, six people that just now indicated they trusted you as their Savior. What a wonderful thing it is to see this happen. And we know that, Lord, all of us here as believers are a part of this. If we're attending here and a part of this church, we're a part of seeing this happen right before our very eyes. People coming to know the truth and discovering the gift of eternal life is offered through faith alone in Jesus Christ. Discovering the meaning of John 3.16 maybe in a fresh new way that, Lord, your love for us is so great that you are willing to sacrifice your Son that whosoever would believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. Lord, we pray that these and the many believers that are here might uh, seek after the truth as they would for hid treasure, that they would be willing to apply their minds to understand what the Bible is saying. That they would pray, Lord, that you would illuminate their understanding and let them discover these wonderful truths. We pray that each one would share then those things that they have learned with others and be creative, even if they just invited people to church. We know they could impact many lives with the gospel of Jesus Christ and see God working in their life in a way they had never seen or thought possible before, they would make the choice to do that. We pray for great things over the holidays to happen. We pray we could be creative. Think about who we might invite over, who we might invite to church, who we might give the gospel to, who we might be able to reach with this wonderful message. And, and to step outside of our, our normal uh, uh, limits and boundaries to, to reach out to somebody that maybe is even a stranger to us and invite them to come or to join us for dinner here at the church or at our home for Thanksgiving or for Christmas and to reach out with this message and share it with others. We just ask you to bless uh, the meal that will follow now, the Iwana meal, and our service tonight, the Tuesday night classes, the Wednesday night prayer meeting and Bible study, and the many other ways that we reach out through individual people talking to other people about Christ. And we just pray you'd give us a great week. And uh, we thank you again for those who came this morning. Bless them in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, we're going to sing a chorus, then we'll go to the back building to eat. We invite everybody to come. And uh, eat with us back there. Uh, if you were smelling the barbecued uh, 
aroma out in the yard, you'll know it's going to be a wonderful meal. If you don't like chicken, they do have, I think, meatloaf. Uh, 